Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to the show. I mean, another sensational guest. I mean, the hits keep coming. I mean, and this time in video. Remember, uh, we, uh, if you guys can remember, we had this great guest on uh, in the audio era of the Nikhil Hogan show. And now I'm so happy to welcome back this time. I can say it, Professor Nicola Canzano. I'm so excited. Professor Canzano, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks a lot, Nikhil. It's great to be back. It's good to see you. Thanks so much I for having me. Yeah, I wish, you know, honestly, gr taking, uh, when I was an undergraduate in music college, I wish I knew more early music musicians because I, honestly, when it comes to music, they're much more logical, they're much more straightforward, and they cut straight to the bone. I mean, like, uh, oh, you're flattering me right off the gate. Huh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but I'm, re I'm being really serious here because like in, in, in many ways, I think an early musician t looks at music in such a just a straightforward way. There's no like it's, it's just so direct and to the point. And so maybe you can be my guide to Baroque music. And now you're a professor of harpsichord and, I, and maybe... You can clue us in into the kinds of things you help your students with, and maybe that would be really illuminating. And I, I really want to get as much as I can out of this episode. So, sure, you mean like um, you mean my experiences with people who come more from the quote unquote uh, you know contemporary uh, classical music side of things, and what kinds of things I see teaching them you know their first sort of early music lessons. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good that's that's a good start too. So uh, maybe we should start there. So I. Um, what what is this, what's the general kind of student that you normally get? Is it early music students, or do you get kind of like converts, so to speak? Well, I would be happy. So I would be happy to make a few converts, but all of my my so all my students are at Michigan State, and Michigan State is um, uh, quite an old university. is actually the first one in the whole country to have a harpsichord department. Uh, if you wow. can believe that. But of That's course, awesome. that only lasted for a little while. Uh, and then there were some changeovers with with the institution and, uh, and and it went away. And so this is the first time they've had a harpsichord department in, I think, at least 80 or 90 years. So I think it's a great sign that a university like Michigan State, which has, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's um, it's a big, big university that uh, does a, a lot of different things. I think it's a great sign that they have an early music department now, uh, because it's a sign of uh, changing times. You know, it's a it's it's not a it's not a conservatory. Uh, it's not you know a um, Juilliard or a uh, you know Boston Conservatory or a Scola Cantorum or anything like that. Not that that's a point against it. It's just not the kind of school that it is, and uh, and therefore the fact that they are hiring. Um, people specifically for early music, and they, they hired also this year an organ professor um, who has some knowledge of, of that kind of thing. Uh, you know, it's a sign that, that early music is becoming more and more accepted uh, and, and in fact necessary, you know, to maintain some kind of, uh, well, legitimacy, I suppose, is the best word that's coming to mind, although I, I would like that, to choose. That, that is one. kind of astounding, right, if you think about it, that they would... Uh... Yeah, there is a, are people just like, how did this come to be? And I mean, maybe you might not be aware of the inner workings, but like, are people like keeping an eye on like, like certain things and trends in music education saying, huh, a lot of people are interested in like maybe historic methods of pedagogy. And this is getting a little bit more popular. We're getting inquiries. Do you, yeah, do you have any been... idea of how it's, <laughs> it's, it's like the, how people are kind of the culture, yeah, I mean, so I've... to speak? I've been a professor for a matter of months, so to so to speak, like I, I have a, a you know a deep knowledge of, of, of you know the minds <laughs> of musical academia would, would not really be correct. But I, I have been in it for a while, and I can at least tell you what I think. I can certainly see that's palpable. Yeah. Um, for example, it is now anathema to perform Mozart with like a hundred twenty piece orchestra. You know, this was done routinely in like the 50s, 60s, 70s, and stuff like that. And I think 
you know, uh, it's it's also anathema to play Bach with tons of vibrato. You know, you're not going to catch some violinist wailing away, you know, <laughs> like it's Wagner on uh, on solo Bach anymore because it's just considered tasteless now. And I think HP is the reason for that. I think a lot of contemporary contemporary musicians uh, that that don't do HP specifically are certainly aware of it, and uh, at the very least. Um, you know, have been, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, they've been influenced by it, whether they know it or not. Yeah. So I think, I think there are palpable changes in what is considered uh, acceptable for performance. And I think the number of programs that, that have, the number of schools that have harpsichords, the number of, of programs that have early music departments is growing slowly, but continually growing. I mean, since like 1930 or 40, Right, it's been it's been a steady climb. So I still think the HP movement is is definitely growing. Um, it's and it's pissing off some people, which is great <laughs> uh, because it means that because it means that they're threatened by it, which means that it has a presence. Right. I mean, I'm I'm not I'm not all for being threatening or anything like that, but but it's a good sign, right? So um, with with regard to HP, um, are you? Talking about interpretation, are you talking about instrumentation? Are you talking about theory? Are you talking about pedagogy? all these things? All Is it these all, things. all yeah. in all? Okay, it's so all wrapped like, up. it's all like one package. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I people are working on me big time to get me away from this equal temperament. Like, there's a lot of people say, Nick, you know, this equal temperament is kind of a scam. Yeah. <laughs> so, and can you, can you? Give me your side of it, and now do you? I know you might be biased or a harpsichordist, but um, yeah, <laughs> tell me about it. You know but, what's but, funny? But tell me um, about temperaments and tunings. Yeah. All right. Temperaments and tunings. Yeah, I mean, I think so. Equal temperament was was invented by lutenists in like the 16th century, actually. So it's very, very old, and people have had thought of it basically almost, you know, uh, almost forever. I mean, it's so certainly since the advent of tonal music. So, so it's been around for a long time. Um, the modern piano sounds okay uh, in equal temperament, and I don't think anybody should really take away equal temperament from the modern piano, which is sort of a, uh, a marvel of engineering, actually. I mean, it's, it's, it's constructed in such a way that some of the more undesirable acoustic effects of equal temperament are purposefully damped in uh, the modern piano, which allows it to sound pretty good. I mean, a harpsichord is just wood and wire. So but we have to do what we can to make it sound okay. And nature doesn't really think equal temperament sounds good. So, I mean, my opinion on temperaments is that they, they're, I mean, it's, it's just, um, the, the, the fact that a, uh, uh, the fact that there is any real, you know, body of work on temperament at all, it's just because it's a problem that's not really solvable that there's an infinite number of solutions to. You know, how do you basically make uh, a modular system of pitches for something that isn't actually modular, right? You're going to get these, like, you know, like in order to get a perfect octave and get things that sound in tune, you have to have things that sound out of tune. It's just a mathematical um, necessity. Yeah, so... Um, it's it's a necessary evil. That's basically how I feel about it. I one thing that I think was quite a compelling argument for non equal temperament was the fact that in certain keys you get certain special unique characteristics out of that particular chords, particular things. It just will sound fresher, more striking. Whereas if it has that bluntness of the equal temperament, now what what's your perspective on that? Uh, I mean, for the longest time, I tuned my harpsichord to quarter comma, um, and and what I would do is that if I encountered keys that were that didn't sound good, I would just transpose them <laughs> into <laughs> keys that sounded okay. Uh, but lately, I've actually kind of settled on um, young one, which is a well temperament, which means that it's sort of close to equal. Um, and uh, you know, the reality is these things like Volati and, and Needhart and Young and, and uh, Werkmeister, you know, all these temperaments that people like to throw the names at, they're all basically equal, actually. They're very, very close to equal. Okay. So basically, I mean, like in an ideal world, we would be able to play an equal temperament and it would sound good. So the piano is basically sort of the optimum solution. To well, what's, well, what's, what's, what's a bad 
point about equal temperament? What sounds lame about it? Is it is it the 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 thirds, the fifths? What's is it just yeah, generally I mean, kind I mean, of not so great? Yeah, I mean, if so, if you were to like have sine waves play equal temperament, it would sound ugly, just because the 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 waveforms are not nice ratios of one another, right? I mean, okay. in just temperament, um, you know, all of these pitches are are really nice uh, multiples of the others, essentially. And so our brains really like that, and that's why we perceive them as consonant. Um, but in equal temperament, all of those are off, right? It's sort of um, it's sort of convenience um, at the expense of beauty, and the harpsichord isn't going to make those sound good. So, so basically, you the, the optimization problem is how do you play in the maximum number of keys and get it to sound the least ugly? Right. So Do yeah, we something, really something... need to play in so many keys. Can we just like choose three or four and just have that's time? that's how I feel honestly, but that's not a popular <laughs> opinion. <laughs> I mean, why why do we need so many? I mean, in, in like a tune, you know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think there, there's there's like real issues of tessitura and stuff like that, but you don't need more than a few keys. I mean, three keys was enough for Monteverdi. Why isn't it enough yeah, for is us? That so. Yeah, I mean, really? yeah, they didn't. Okay. I mean, it was C, F, and G basically for a long time, right, right, you know, and and the associated minors. Although not really, I mean, nobody was playing B major that often, you know, back in the 16th right. century. It just wasn't really a thing. I mean, of course, there are exceptions to all of this, but um, but yeah, there's no real. <laughs> I don't know. This is this is. I'm wading into waters where I feel like there's. No, that's uh, okay. Yeah. No, you're, you're, help, you're helping me understand and and. Uh... That that's a good now now you're sitting at your instrument, which is so cool. I mean, I always love to get a player to come on the show that they can just play, and uh, maybe we should just maybe we should just start just ha just play anything you want. It's a, you have free <laughs> okay. reign on this show, okay. Professor right. Canzano. Just anything uh, you want. Uh, okay, we'll play anything I want. Okay, sure. yeah, you got it. Uh... the deal with these harpsichordists why are they so talented <laughs> such such a great endorsement for the instrument you know yeah, just, oh, please just, no, but the difference is and I, i'm not making a joke here i mean like you really i mean what was that that was bach right no i'm kidding i'm yeah. just kidding of course <laughs> i'm just kidding of course you made that up right i mean you improvised that and that's yeah. that's now this is the thing you know i was i was 
telling my students that music is often a thinking person's game. If you're really be trying to be a musician, it's like how much were you thinking there or was it a lot of it subconscious? Were you drawing on like muscle memory or um, were you actively like, okay, I'm here. I'm, I'm here right now. I'm thinking, where do we go from here? Like, I'm, so, you, I, I'm glad you explain, asked. That. Can, you, can you explain the thought process? Yeah, I, I, I can try because I'll tell you what, I think a lot about this. All right. And, um, and there are certain improvisers out there who will go out and say, I don't know how I know how to do this. Sucks to suck. You know, like, which is like, I think unhelpful, but I also kind of see where they're coming from. Like I had to really right. think about how it is. I know how to do a lot of this and, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing. I think a lot of my practice these days is not technical, but psychological. And, and I have to really focus on just like, you know, getting into the music and not, and not letting other things sort of get in the way. So I, I tell my students all the time about the three brains that we have. We have our brain brains, and we have our ear brains, and we have our finger brains. And I try to make my brain brain do as little as humanly possible. Oh. So I only have flashes of brain brain things, basically. So like, uh, for example, uh, my, my forebrain is keeping track of where I have cadenced and making sure that I don't cadence twice in the same place. And if I do that, it was sort of the beginning and ending of a section. So I'm pretty sure I cadenced twice in E minor. I might have avoided it. I'd certainly at some point I remember I've already cadenced here and I don't remember what I decided. If I decided to just let it happen or if, or if I avoided, I might have, I probably actually, one of my favorite moves is to avoid it by, instead of going sharp three, I'll play flat three. So what you would expect. <laughs> But in style, do something like that. And that gets you up a fourth, right? Which sort of mm. takes, you, takes you away. So I'm keeping track of that. Otherwise, I am sort of just letting... It, it's, it's, a, it's a game of chicken with my fingers. And I'm sort of letting them do what they want to do. And I'm taking in information. And I'm listening to what I've played. And I'm composing the next few notes and then executing that and trying to avoid any conscious, oh, what do I do now, right? How, I'm, far, I'm how far are you ahead of your fingers? So like in the sense that you're in the middle of something, maybe a sequence, maybe an idea. I've, do you have the next idea ahead of mine? Are you like, do, are you already thinking a, a, a two or three kind of in terms of form? Because I know you're a great composer and I know for you, composition and improvisation are are kind of like they're, they're related, right? I mean, they obviously oh, related. Absolutely. So, absolutely. like, where, like, how far ahead are you in the form of your improvisation in the moment? It's a very good question. Um, I would say that it varies, but in general, I am. In general, honestly, I think on average, I'm probably right with it. I'm probably right with mm -hmm. my fingers. Sometimes I'm behind my fingers. You know, and my, I mean, like often actually, you know, I will let my fingers sort of play something that I know is easy and sounds nice and then basically kick that problem of how do I make this fit in the composition down the road, right? I mean, like you can actually kind of, you can, not randomly, okay, but you can build phrases, putting pieces of things that you know will, excuse me, probably work together uh, and then kind of basically like offloading all the thoughts on how you would end the phrase, you know? So like if I play, um, <laughs> like I was letting my fingers lead most of that basically. So okay. basically in the second that I'm done with, um, only when I get there, do I think of, and then I take that information and I think, okay, uh, I'm here. And I know that this chord usually sounds good after this chord. So I'm going to let my fingers do it. And I know there are a number of chords that sound good after this chord. So we'll see what my fingers do. Um, you know, and I might go. Instead, right? And now I'm in a different key and I think, okay, well now I'm here. So it's, all, it's always this sort of ever-changing landscape of just keeping track of the salient bits like where I've cadenced and the type of figures I've used, 
um, just so that I don't sound redundant or that I'm wandering. But otherwise, I, it's actually mostly led by my fingers. I'm letting them mm. do what I want. My ear is taking that in and putting out a few options. And my fingers are kind of just picking one of those tracks and the cycle right. repeats. Right. If that makes no, sense. No, it does. Absolutely. Now, you know, you're a young guy. I mean, you're a young man. You're, a, you're a, just a... Just a virtual, so young talent. I'm asking. Please. Here's a question. No, I'm just, <laughs> no I'm, I'm. I really, I really do. I do. I definitely admire you. I'm a fan. <laughs> let, let me My ask you this is. question. Yes. Um, the question is like, I asked. Uh, I can't remember which professor I asked. I asked like, you know, you know, CPE Bach has this huge treatise so with tons of rules in the third base section. I mean, do you know all the rules of Vasco Continuo and you're just picking where you feel? Or are you, is there anything that you're still learning in terms of like the language or, or like, oh, I mean, God, like, all the time. I, I all mean, the time. As, uh, because I, I feel I, like and you could explain to someone who's new to Vasco Continuo are there a lot of rules? How long is it going to take to absorb these rules? And it's one thing to know a rule, it's another thing to know like the thousand ways to put into practice one rule, right? Okay, I, I want to give an uh, immediate shout out. I'm going to stare at the camera. Hi, Will. Uh, because my, my buddy, Will Copeland, if he ever listens to this interview, is going to be pulling his hair out before I, I answer this question. Because, I mean, this is basically almost all we talk about at this point. Um, the answer <laughs> is, is definitively yes. There are a lot of rules when it wait, comes I for, to Wait, I forgot the question. What was yes yeah. to? Okay. There are a lot <laughs> of rules the... when it comes to Basso Continuum. Tons of yes. rules, lots of rules. Okay, and and he's coming to me just about every week with a different book, and you know, chasing me down the street. You know, just like, look, look over here, look, see, see what you're doing is wrong, or like, see, you know, like all of this. Stuff. <laughs> it's just, it's very entertaining, and I'm learning a lot having these conversations with him. So, also, yes, of course, I have lots to learn. Uh, my opinion on the matter is that uh, there are a huge number of opinions about how to play Boston Continuo. This changes. Not only, of course, with geography and uh, and time period, but also in the same place and time, different authors will say totally different things about Basso right. Continuo. Can you but, okay? Just uh, so you're, by by temp place you're talking about like French, Italian, so on and so forth. Right. Yes. Exactly. Could you give an example of some contradictions that you find interesting? Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, temporally, uh, there are a, you know there's a lot of things going on. Um, we have reason to believe. Uh, you know, for example, that that certain things like, um, well, that's the, that's the thing. I I can't really cite any sources on this, and most of these are are coming from my buddy, who is very very uh, <laughs> very adamant about this. But if you trust him, which I do, he's a smart smart guy, uh, then you can trust me. Uh, one of the things that he's brought to my attention, for example, is uh, is that that this idea of uh, uh, chakature, which is basically like adding chord tones that aren't there, probably became a thing at a certain point and was not always there. So so for a while, people played this. And then after a while, people played, you know. So they oh. added notes that weren't in the chord, right? As opposed to just. Oh. Right. And of course, they wouldn't hold them down and things like that. Uh, and this is apparently some technique that's new. One thing that you can read about immediately in CPE Bach is that he um, will say how annoyed he is that Italians tend to roll every chord. Yeah. <laughs> And, and, you know, so they'll play like. And things like that. And, you know, CB Bach would probably rather you play like. Right. Single sound. Boom. Like that. Yeah, or just a few here and there. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm an advocate for using all of these things as long as it's in service of the phrasing and it doesn't sound too stylistically out of order. Mm. Um, of course, that's that's a matter that, that we're not really well equipped to evaluate, right. whether it sounds stylistically correct or not, because we're not from there and, and ideas of stylistic correctness are excruciatingly vague. Okay. Um, but that's not bad. I think that's just like rolling a chord, adding a few non-chord. That's, that's okay. But like, uh, would you say that in terms of the general, like, and I've used this term before, operating system. <laughs> so in terms of the Basso Continuo continental operating system, 
are you going to, is there like uh, hard rules and then kind of the softer rules that you can kind of break? Are the hard yeah, rules mean, pretty much clear? Yeah, the hard rules are pretty clear. You, you, you basically, you don't want to interfere with more important parts, okay? You are, as a continuo player, a cello or a bassoon or a bass or whatever else is in the continuo section. You know, you are not an independent thing. So in general, you should not be adding counterpoint to your, um, you know, to your realizations. Now, again, there's- Wait, there's what does that mean? Wait, hold on a second. What, what, what did you mean by that? So for example, you know, I, I shouldn't be adding melodies that go along with the melodies that are already there. Okay. Uh, so, you know, for example, if I have, you know, if I'm playing some piece, piece by, by Corelli and it's going, you know, uh, or something like that, I shouldn't also be going in the keyboard like, you know, and, and, and lots of people will disagree with me on this, by the way. And I also mm. do it myself, yep. but I, I do it whenever I know I'm not going to interfere with things. Okay, and or maybe like the restatement of the theme at the end where everyone's going crazy. <laughs> the thing is, like, the, the harpsichord sounds stupid when you do that. You know, like, it's not, like, it's it's not an equal member of, mm. like, the trio sonata society. It's like the know, guitar. It, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, like, um, I had to write a piece for obligato harpsichord, cello and violin over the summer. And I found that just wildly difficult. Because, uh, you know, the harpsichord is such a different timbre from those two instruments. And it just yeah. it's, doesn't yeah. sing, you know what I mean? At least at least not as well. I mean, that's not what it was built for, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, this is getting off track. It sounds like I'm, I'm no. crap, crapping on the harpsichord and saying that it shouldn't participate. No, in no this is very nuanced. It's, it's very, I like it. No, it's, 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 it's good. But, but certainly, I shouldn't be like, so, so there are some schools of thought, for example, all right, um, typically older, where I should be doubling actually what the melody line is doing, right? Okay, so if the melody mm -hmm. line is doing, then I should be doing that too. Yeah. With chords underneath it in the same thing. Okay, but I should not decorate that part. Yeah. Because then that will really, that will really interfere with yeah. the solo instrument. Right. I could see like, um, like you know, in those solfeggio class lessons, the maestro would kind of like also play the melody to kind of keep a young student kind of on track. What do you think of that? That's a different situation. This is totally. that's, ped that's pedagogical. Okay. You know, I mean, if, if you're trying to, to mess around with a melody and you want somebody to play it so that you have something to go against, that's different, I think, totally. Then if I'm trying to, I mean, look, I mean, a trio sonata is a great example. There's three independent parts in the trio sonata. It's not that the harpsichord can't add color. And this is a point of disagreement too, basically. All right, but mm -hmm. it's basically about how you add this color. I think most people would agree that you should not add the color by playing something in the exact same register as the, as the topmost part that is different mm -hmm. from what they are playing because that is a direct interference, right? I think that's a good example of what not to do. Now, I might play this passage uh, I'm using some similar similar ones. Let me come up with something like. Let's say that's the passage. Okay, I might play. Right, or something like that. And mm. add passing tones. Okay, but these are all in general in the middle of the texture. Right, instead of. Uh, or something like that. Yeah, so I'm adding things. But for me, this is to be rhythmic. Right, the audience shouldn't really hear what the continuo player's notes are, but they should hear the the wood and the tinks and the, all the higher up the partials. Right. So I'm, I, you know, um, I had a teacher, Richard Egar, who called it beatboxing, and I quite like that word <laughs> because that's basically what I'm trying to do by adding these rhythms. Right, I want the audience yeah. to hear in the violins, you know, ya da di di da 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 da, but in the harpsichord, can you know, boom. Right, and that's just like a something nice percussive of... to support right. the ensemble. Yes, exactly. Yeah, but yeah we're mm. the drummer of the ensemble. So yeah. <laughs> now people will disagree, right? Like my friend Will will say that's not allowed because you are adding counterpoint, yeah. which is true. I am adding counterpoint. I think it is quite harmless uh, because nobody, except for freaks like him, and and of course you know other people. I mean, I would notice it myself, but I just don't mind that much. Right, right. Certainly in a recording situation. 
I mean, the harpsichord, if, if it's well mixed, you shouldn't be able to hear. Right. You, you shouldn't be able to write out a realization of the harpsichord part if it's a well mixed uh, recording. Okay? Right. So I think these little percussive bits add color in a way that's harmless and does not detract from the part writing. And as long as you're not detracting from the part writing and you are adding colors that you think are tasteful and true to the music, I think you are doing something all right. Let's go to solo keyboard now. So just solo compositions. And, you know, there were a lot of Partimento obsessed fans who like to, and you're, of course, a very expert person on Partimento too. You've written your own Partimento. I mean, can you believe that, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> writing your own Partimento? I mean, the, we're still struggling with the, with the, with the, just dying with book one, you know, and, and here he is not happy with books four, five, six. He's on his own Partimento. That's, that's wonderful. So, we're, so talking about rules now, rules, a student is going to come to you and say like, good gravy, look at Fenroli's book of rules. Do I have to learn all of that? And, and like, or like CPE Bach or, you know, and so on and so forth. What's your approach to systematically learning as many of the important rules and progressively in a way that's building on the previous step? Yeah, this is a really important question because we are living in a really exciting time where there should be infinite resources for this kind of thing, but there simply aren't. Uh, and so we're kind of having to like make them, you know, I think Derek um, has done a great job um, with his compendium. And I certainly use that for my students. I, I use an, an edited version of it. Um, it's sort of reordered and I've edited some of his endings. Um, but I plan on actually releasing my my own sort of version of it soon when I find some free time. I've been working on it for a long time, so I'll have a little compendium that includes basically basic counterpoint rules and then cadences and then sequences um, and then some basic ideas for diminution. And this is meant to be like a primer for your students. Um, oh, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> counterpoint can be learned in a lesson or two, at least just the basic tenets of it. There's basically only three rules in counterpoint. No parallel perfect intervals. And uh, and resolve and uh, prepare dissonances properly. That, that's it. There's, there's really, I mean, two if you want to lump the last two together. There's really only two rules in counterpoint. No, no perfect parallels and dissonances must be properly handled. And, and that's that. I mean, and then all of the tricks of counterpoint, I think you just kind of learn. So I make all my students compose. First, they'll realize um, some figured bass in four parts and play. And of course they're learning continual all the while. And at first I actually don't really care about their parallels and stuff like that. I will just let them play whatever they want as long as the correct chord is going over the correct note. Don't care about doublings, don't care about voice leading. And then I will slowly chisel away at it like marble, be like, hey, why don't you try, you know, having contrary motion uh, that's so you know, good. That's yeah. like, um, cause I, I have two kids and, and, you know, I'm just, I'm learning how they acquire language and it's not the case where I, I stop them and I say, never say that because you're building, going to build right. a, ha a bad habit if you, if you say that. And, but I notice their language refines over time. And, and, and it, so I can totally understand what you're saying here. Right. So it's just, it's too much. I mean, it's too much to get lost in the weeds. I think this is something that new students struggle with. They understand that there are indeed, at a very high level, a lot of, of constraints placed upon what is considered good and, and proper playing. And counterpoint is a huge part of that. And it seems to be a thing that many students come to be rather obsessed with, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, and I um, de-emphasize it. Now, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very strict about composition. You know, I mean, if you if you have some parallel fifths in your inner parts, I don't care. Like you, you are getting a proverbial beat, right? <laughs> I, and of course, I'm, I never I would never berate anybody or anything like that. But you yeah, see yeah. what I'm saying? You know, I'm I quite strict point, yeah. about it. I'm quite strict about it in composition. In in improvisation, I'm not. I mean, like if you're playing fifths in your outer parts all the time, I'll say something. You know, and and but I mean, I just I played parallel fifths just then actually when I improvised for you. And and here's the thing. Here's the main point. I realized that I was about to play parallel fifths and it is far worse for me to stop for a split second, even if it doesn't really interrupt the rhythm that much, right? It's worse for me to interrupt the flow than to play parallels. It's just a, it's a way more egregious mistake in my opinion. Yeah. So, you know, so, so why get bogged down by it? You know, so I, I, I just, I, I try to teach people to focus on, 
a few things and then build it up from there. Now to now again, uh, it's long on examples, right? Baroque music is definitely long on examples. So uh, it's long on rules and it's long on examples. So it's double whammy. Um, so where do you like? You mentioned Corelli in our last interview. Do you have any other? Uh, you can continue talking about Corelli, but do you have other favorites in the literature that you like to draw from when you're teaching? Uh, honestly, I mostly use Corelli, truly. Um, and I think I explained why last time, but just really quickly, it's, it's just because all of these ingredients that we learn are very plainly presented in Corelli. Corelli is like the very best margarita pizzas and, you know, um, <laughs> and, and just like sugo semplice, just, just very, just a few ingredients. So they're just really cleanly presented, right? When you have a really, really good dish that only has a few ingredients, you can taste all of them and you know exactly how they were used. And that's sort of what Corelli is, you know. Uh, yeah. Bach is basically the same as Corelli, just extremely decorated in every way, harmonically, mm. consequently, gesturally. He uses more <laughs> parts, right? And it's harder to it's harder to cut through you know, these like really, really, really complex hedges and get to, you know, just the simple yeah. rose bush sort of underneath. Corelli kind of takes care of that for you and shows you the first sort of ways that you can decorate these ingredients. Now, I, I hold on a second. The, the, the trio sonata, though, there's a lot of crossing of the parts. So what do you say to that, especially on a keyboard? Do you what what do you just don't do those parts and do the other parts? Well, we use I use the trio sonatas for sight singing. Um, but, but for Partimento and for figured bass, I use the violin sonatas. Okay. Uh, op Opus five is basically like the textbook that I use. I mean, all, all of my students know almost all the movements in Opus five by now. <laughs> They're probably sick of it. Uh, but it's, it's just the perfect resource. Really, really Opus five is the perfect resource because you've, you've got all these ingredients on, on display such that somebody who just learned about them yesterday can recognize them in Corelli today. And, and then you've got like. A, a simple diminuted part. If you want to look at the violin part, you can be like, well, here's how he decorates this. Check it out. You know, but also we can play them as part of empty because they are quite melodic, right? And so the phrases are well built. They're not too long. He, you know, it's clear where his cadence patterns are. It's clear where his sequences are, right? We can, we can gain an idea, a preliminary idea about just about everything we'd like to know about music, about, about counterpoint, figure bass. Um, we can learn about simple structures, right? We can learn about the, the interplay of these ingredients, the sequences and the cadences. We can, we can get a bunch of different cadences, right? Uh, we have our first exposure to diminution. I mean, and, and it's perfect. And it's better than looking at something like Bach because Bach requires a lot of explanation. And I think importantly to understand Bach, you need to understand this whole idea of reduction, which is mm. quite nasty, yes. right? How do, how do we simplify a diminuted part? What Where is, is the, the of... skeleton underneath the scaffolding? Right. What is that? Yeah, yeah, that's right. so true. It's much easier to go, for, it's, it's much easier to put flesh on a skeleton, right? Yeah, mm. um, yeah. A, a skill that everybody must eventually develop is basically being able to sort of uh, take, take away the flesh on the fly and see what's underneath immediately and gain a clear picture of this to understand how to improvise around it and what not to do, et cetera. So to be a good continual right. player, I think one must have that skill, but it is a very, very difficult thing to teach beginners. It requires years of experience of looking at this kind of thing. It's, it's not easy. You know, it's, it's like teaching somebody how to take an interval when they haven't had pre-calculus yet. Mm -hmm. Not sure now, how that math analogy is going to be lost. <laughs> it's good, <laughs> and people will come back twenty years and then just say, "Ah, oh, it makes sense now." Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the difference? You're the Baroque. You can help me here. Vivaldi versus Corelli. What's the difference? They both were great violin virtuosos, great violin composers. What's the difference there? Uh, big difference. I mean, uh, Corelli worked in Rome mostly. Um, he was born. God, I forget. I want to say like Bologna or, or somewhere near there, but um, and Vivaldi worked in uh, in uh, Venice. Um, uh, Corelli worked for the court, um, and uh, Vivaldi worked mostly for the uh, Ostedali, which were uh, you know, as you know, right these these centers of learning for mm. with, with with the nuns and, and the orphans, and uh, and he also he also of course worked worked. Um, for the court and things like that. Um, but I think their styles are quite different. Most importantly, they're from different eras, really. They're, they're, there's, a, there's a generation between them. Uh, uh, Corelli would have been old or um, when Vivaldi was around. And Vivaldi, I think, is this sort of the, the culmination of this hyper-Italian Baroque style where everything is extremely gestural and in your face. 
Uh, and, and and Bach loved and, that, right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Bach certainly loved it. I think Bach is is almost like Vivaldi with uh, with a lot of intricate sort of ropes around it. Mm, um, right. I mean, Vivaldi had to compose really, really quickly, and and you know, he really knew his audience. Uh, I think Corelli. I think Vivaldi's writing is a lot sloppier than Corelli's, but he mm. didn't really have the luxury of making it neat and tidy. So I don't really think he can be blamed for that. I think. I think he's he's every bit as much of a genius. He was just one that that didn't have too many hours, and that he could turn out as much music as he could of that quality is, is nothing short of absolutely remarkable. It takes a first class musician to do what he did, absolutely. So I'm not denigrating Vivaldi, right? Right. Um, but but it is a different style. And I have to say I prefer sort of the simple, refined mm. um, elegance of Corelli to the sort I of like bombastic, you know, <laughs> flourishes yeah. of Vivaldi. Yeah, I like both. No, uh, okay, that's maybe that's improvisation, basso continuo. That's that's a lot of the language. But for repertoire, what kind of things do you like to teach? Seventeenth century, eighteenth century, sixteenth century? What what, oh, what do you teach? I'm so glad you asked. Uh, I'm so so. This new position at at Michigan State has been such a privilege because I get to introduce so so. My students are 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 all piano graduate students. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I and I have one student um, who is working with me on this kind of improvisation stuff, which is really nice. Also, um, the vast majority of them, however, are are piano graduate students who are taking harpsichord because they're either it's required of them, or if they're master students, just because they need a credit or something. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm not. You know, it's not the kind of thing where I'm sitting here really being a taskmaster about how well they play. I'm trying to basically show them this world and teach them to be competent and yeah. um, elegant players. Uh, and, and good ambassadors for early music. You know, I don't want them yeah. going off and saying anything silly about early music and things like that. <laughs> but I want to, I want them to gain an appreciation for this. And, and the coolest part about this, the coolest part about this, is that um, so many of them are totally, totally unexposed to these. Yeah, worlds. like me. Yeah, I have no I idea mean, about. Yeah. I'm. I if Come I speak on, you know, but you know about that. French Baroque music and stuff like that. I just learned from about a. Nicholas de Grigny. I've never heard of him before, and he's yeah. awesome. De Grigny. Yeah. De Grigny. <laughs> yeah, <there you> Remember, <laughs> I, I said to Peter Schubert, Josquin Desprez. I mean, that's the worst you can do. I mean, this may be the worst. <laughs> <laughs> P- to Peter Schubert. Someone has to top that. But anyway, yeah, tell me about the, the repertoire that you pick from. Yeah, so I, I basically I, I get to show these I get to show these pianists this this world of keyboard music that they just don't know about. I mean, for them it starts with Mozart or or Bach, and that's it. I mean, they have no idea that French Baroque music exists. They don't know about the English virginal tradition. They don't know about Fresco Baldi. There's they just amazing, don't know about yeah. it, and it's amazing. I mean, because you know, and, and plenty of them are like, okay, cool, you know, but some of them are like wow you know like they're just like and i think you were the one my day <laughs> you were the one who mentioned william bird and i think oh. uh, maybe a, a couple of months ago i heard his mass for four voices i just oh yeah, man, yeah william he Bird's is pretty good fantastic. he yeah, is fantastic. good and yeah, and fantastic. maybe there's even a case to be said that the 17th century um well yeah that's a question i have for you when was the golden age of basso continuo was it the early 18th century or was it the 17th century uh all right what, what do you think you ready for a hot take Nikhil? let's go i think the golden age of basso continuo is today Ooh, <laughs> there we go i think i think it absolutely is because basso continuo is very likely something that it never really was today. And in fact, there's even different sort of continental styles. So they, they will play very differently in Europe than in the States. And in fact, I've heard a couple of times from friends of mine who've come back from competition saying like, oh, you play too American, you know. But, <laughs> and and that's, that's a certain way of playing. And, and it's interesting yeah. because early music sort of started, you know, I mean, early music was started by a guy who went between, by Arnold Dolmich who kind of had a foot in the States and a foot in Europe. You know, he was, of course, British. Uh, yeah. And, you know, you know, Wanda Landowska and all these people. Uh, and so it, it started in the States not too much after um, uh, Europe. But there's a crucial difference. Because in Europe, this is sort of culturally protected, right? Mm. So, and maybe sort of a similar way. In fact, I've, I've heard people tell me, and, and, and they mean well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm very good. Good friends with this person, but but I've actually had the word said to me, 
well, you know, this is our music, not yours. Mm, wow. Right? Like, whoa, right? Cultural so, appropriation. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, but you're Italian. Right? That doesn't make sense. I mean, you're yeah, Italian. Yeah, yeah white, white people can steal from white people. I think that's probably <laughs> fine. Uh, but, um, but all this is to say, like, you know, maybe, like, I probably wouldn't like it if, like, you know, some French guy came over here and told us how to sing, like, shaker songs. Not that I feel particularly American, but I, I understand that, you know, other Americans probably wouldn't like that. It's easy for me to see why that would annoy people. So I can kind of see that perspective, but but I look at it like this. We have this incredible advantage, right? Because we don't, we're not really beholden to this, uh, the, you know, sort of the cultural crown jewels yeah. that they view this as. And so we can kind of do what we want with it, really. And we can make it our own thing. And I think it's still important to be academic about it and to, and to take into account uh, things, you know, things like treatises and 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 things like direct evidence of how this music was played, because yeah. they probably knew how to make it sound good, and we would like to accomplish the same thing. But I feel yeah. as though there are a huge number of early musicians who place the idea of doing it correctly for the sake of doing it correctly on a pedestal, and mm -hmm. I think that's completely misguided. Our job is always to please our audience and to please ourselves. And if well, you many, are pleasing many of those, I'm uh, sorry to cut you off, uh, but I just wanted to have a quick point. I, sure. I always felt that many of those rules were often a consequence of circumstance. So they, why make a rule? Because it works for that moment. And now if, we, if we're if we not in a particular sort of circumstance, it's just to reproduce it slavishly just because it existed uh, without considering all of the factors might be missing, uh, you know, some a lot of the nuance of this, of the, of the thing. But yeah, sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, I, I agree with you entirely. Uh, so I sort of, I sort of lost my. Oh no, I remember it. It was, um, it was that if we are if if we are pleasing ourselves only by matching a description and trying to triangulate a correct course, you know, I mean, if it's possible to enjoy something for the wrong reason, then I think that's it. Hmm. You know. Yeah. It may not be possible to enjoy something for the wrong reason. I mean, I did physics and getting it correct is all the fun. That's 100 <laughs> percent of the fun. So you know I, I, I get it too. I, I, I get I understand yeah. that aspect also, you know. Yeah. But I think most of these people maybe want to just be thorough and make sure that we explore all these possibilities before we just ignore it and do our own thing and be foppish about it because that's that's also silly. No, this is a good uh, point, I think, uh, Professor Canzano, maybe would you like to play? <laughs> Uh, another, uh, anything you want, um, I, I leave the floor to you. Okay, play another something. Sure, you got yeah, it. Yeah, play another something.
awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so awesome. Leisurely, a leisurely fugue. That was go- that was awesome. I was um, being okay. a bit too careful, I think. We we never uh we never actually mentioned any names of the composers that you were talking about. Uh, we got so excited about the fact that we were you were going we were sharing great composers. Uh, uh, let's actually right. get into the the names now. Well, I mean, you are. I think you already know all my favorite composers. I mean, so for, so for the virginal stuff, I, I use I use William Byrd. Um, uh, I, for the French Brook stuff, I use Couperin and and Elizabeth de la Guerre, who I absolutely adore. And I think it's very important that we show people not only uh, you know women composers and composers of color and all of that, but but people who are dead, um, you know, to show that there is a legacy there also, uh, and and to get people in, inspired and to, and to and to not not allow them to think that this is some sort of new thing that's being shoehorned in, but in fact, there have of, of course been, been great women and people of color all throughout history. So um, there is a, uh, a wonderful, very charming composer by the name of Ignatius Sancho. And I've, I've arranged a lot of uh, his music um, for four parts and it's actually seeing a lot of use. Um, people are performing it because it's fun to listen to. Uh, so I think that's important. Um, so I have Couperin, De La Guerre, I've got Sancho, I use William Byrd. Uh, and I also have people play uh, Bach, which I think is an important window because they know Bach. And so it's a good way for them to kind of feel out how the harpsichord is different. There's a variable that's controlled there. See what I mean? Uh, so if they play the same piece on the harpsichord, right, it's sort of, you know, there's all of a sudden they're confronted with, with all of the ways that the harpsichord is different in a very real scenario. Okay. Um, and of course, beyond that, I just try to give them a, as much of a variety as I possibly can. So, of course, there's the Italian Renaissance, there's Fresco Baldi, there's all, you know, there's all these guys. Now, is Fresco Baldi pre-basso continuo? Is he, is, is he, does he use, like, how, how does he work theoretically? Like, what's going on there? Uh, he died, I think, in the, fifth, uh, in the early 1600s, right? Let's pull yeah. it up. Uh, he died in 1643. So he's decidedly lived during Basso Continuo. Okay. Uh, I yeah. don't, he must have, he must have written, he, you know, he, he has violin sonatas and things like that. And he did write figures. Yes. Yeah. Of course. No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He was firmly in the era of Basso Continuo. Yes. I'm con- okay. I was confused for a moment because he's so, so associated with the obligato keyboard repertoire. Mm. But in yeah. fact, he did write chamber music and songs that have continuo fingers in them. I, I played them. Yes. Okay. Is there like pre basso continuo keyboardists of note worth mentioning? Oh yeah, they didn't really I mean like they I mean in Bird's Day continuo was I mean that wasn't really used in England very much. It was it was firmly an Italian invention, really. And it, it made it into France sort of with you know, I, I mean um Wow, he was born fifteen forty, something like that. That's, that's Fresco well Baldi. Before. That no, no, uh, William Byrd. No, William Byrd. Yeah, <clears throat> right. Yeah, William Byrd is is pretty firmly pre Basso Continuo, and and, and Basso yeah. Continuo in England, you know, it took a minute. Like like Italy was the first place to have Basso Continuo, and that's where all of the first fifty years of writing in Basso Continuo comes from. Hmm. Uh, and then slowly it made its way through Germany to France, and and eventually England, and all of that. I, actually, I'm I have no idea about the timeline of this, but I feel very confident in saying that Italy was really the only place with it for for a short while. Right, right. Okay, I'm gonna. Can I throw a few names at you? Yeah, of course. You throw whatever you want at me. Okay, let's see. How about uh, Swelink? Svelink. There we go. Okay, I, mean, I shouldn't do this. I'm just, I'm just setting yeah. myself up for very negative comments. But go ahead. No, no, yeah. no, no, come on. What do you mean? Actually, I think it's quite charming because it's very clear that you're curious and, Thank you. and passionate Thank about this. Thank and you. how are you gonna know how it's pronounced? It's no big yeah, deal. Yeah. No one's. It's, no one's. Yeah. We have nothing to someone's be. Someone's going to say, about. "Oh, you can check." Yeah, but, <laughs> you have no, you have but anyway, to be yeah. S- about. I pronounced the word "arai" "ari" my entire life. <laughs> That's pretty All bad. Right. So <laughs> you know what are you going to do? Yeah, um, I just had never heard anybody say it, and then one day I heard somebody say it, and I'm like, "You mean Ari?" And they just laughed at me. So what are you going to do? Um, so Svelink, very, very, very important uh, historical figure, yeah, uh, because he, his pedagogy basically is the basis for like Baroque pedagogy everywhere. I mean, all of the great keyboard players of the Baroque era can trace their teachers back to Svelink. I believe that's true of Bach. Um, I, I believe that's true of Handel. I, I might be making both of those up, but I feel very confident in saying that Svelink 
is is one of the main originators of this whole um, diminution culture, I want to say. I mean, he was really <laughs> sort of the first guy to do corral preludes as we know them. Um, and uh, he kind of started this 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 um, now quite glorified um, uh, uh, culture of organ improvisation, basically. It kind of all goes back to him. So, so guys like Zita de Vries, who I admire very, very much, I think owe oh, their good education eventually to Svelin, who worked, by the way, in the same sort of areas that that uh, that Zitza and these guys are from. And and there's a very strong organ improvisation culture in in, in that part of the world, um, and it makes sense because that's kind of where it was born. Do you play the organ? Yeah, I worked as an organist for, for 14 years. And I got to tell you, I really miss my Sunday organ job. I, I found it a very fulfilling job. I worked for the Episcopal Church for 13 years. And um, since I was 14 years old, I worked for them. But ever since I moved to New York, uh, I just sort of sub around. Mm. This last summer, I had the pleasure of playing at this this church in Lincoln Center, Christ and St. Stephen's, which has uh, the... the um, which is distinguished in that the professor of organ at Juilliard, Paul Jacobs, uh, played there for a while, and they've they've had some some excellent organists in the past that I feel lucky to count myself somewhat among. So I was there for five months over the summer filling in, and they sort of let me do what I wanted. I mean, I invited my friends, and we played a bunch of ecclesiastical chamber music, which is great because there's not very much of it actually. I mean, things for like a couple violins, basso continuo, and voice. Mm. That's that's religious. Uh, it's, it's hard to find sacred music, actually, that's chamber music, because it was they were sort of kept separate on purpose. So I played right. a lot of Chima, a lot of obscure Italian composers, and a lot of it's very, very nice music. Um, but yes, I do play organ. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, now, this is, maybe I don't know if I should bring this up, but I remember you posted something about Handel. Um, with some, oh. some with some counterpoint. And I don't know if it was a copyist error or was Handel... No, no. Handel, Handel wrote fifths all the time, and this okay. should, this is this is not this is not me. This you know, I, I'm not I'm not trying to poo poo Handel. Okay, I'm trying to by saying these things rise everybody else up. Okay, it is not that we should not revere these these people. They were absolutely brilliant, very 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 good at what they did, and I am not trying to take one ounce of that away from them. I admire them just as much as, as everybody else. Well, people get yeah, this yeah. idea that they're in the published works. There's not a single counterpoint mistake. Is that is, is that absolutely a... false? I mean, I can think right. of one in Bach. I mean, Bach Bach has chorales for God's sake with parallel fifths in them, and it's actually my my YouTube logo with the parallel fifths with like the X's eyes. That's taken from a Bach chorale. He wrote parallel fifths in his chorale, right? I mean, look. I mean, it, it's clear it was just a mistake. Yeah, yeah. There it is. That's from a Bach chorale. Yeah. <laughs> Right. So, it, you know, these things happen. And it, it's funny. There's a quote from Handel. There's actually an incredible website. If, if nothing else comes from this interview, uh, <laughs> it, there's a great website, which everybody should enjoy. It will make your life better. It's like Handel quotes or something like that. And maybe it's not handelquotes.com, but it's a whole bunch of literal quotes and anecdotes about Handel. And it's like written, and a lot of them are transliterated from like diaries of the time in his accent. So they will like notate his accent, like Vata Diffel and things like that. It's very funny. And so there's this one quote like Handel. I forget if he was asked about his Concerti Grossi or maybe some of his trio sonatas, but the quote it's is- It's not this, is it? Is it this? Oh, it's that one. Yeah, it's great. It's <laughs> an excellent website. And he says, I wrote like the Diffel in those days, right? I wrote like the devil in those days, meaning like, yeah, yeah. yeah I didn't really know what I was doing yet. And that's not really true. I mean, Handel's music is, there's, there's not very much music that's so effortlessly charming as Handel. I think Vivaldi comes yeah. close, or, or they vie for that position. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he wrote a lot of parallels. I mean, like a lot of chords that didn't need to be, you know, that probably could have been voiced better, some inner parts that could be less boring or at least less jumpy and things like that. Mm -hmm. But these are all quite, small points and to think that he wrote operas in three weeks with mm. as few mistakes and with all of the charm and brilliance that they have i mean it's just like what on earth you know what i mean uh so i just but so all how, my com point how common are these mistakes if somebody's saying who's kind of new to this are they are they is it like everywhere or is it just a few isolated incidents Hard, hard I know. I know to, Brahms. I know Brahms collected a collection of parallel eights yes. and stuff. Right. Yeah, he had a yeah. that sh, yeah that sh, that uh, was collected. 
hard for me to say. Suffice it to say, I, I'm going to say two things, and I promise not to be long-winded. First thing is, they're not as uncommon as you would think. I, not, I'm not going to sit here and say they're common because they're not, but they're not as uncommon. And the reason that I call attention to them, and I never finished saying this before, is not to bring these people down, but to show you that their amount of expertise is not unattainable. And that they are human. It's very good. Yes. And I and, love that. and that and that the reason I think that people have not met these standards is because nobody has tried in earnest. I mean, they were human, right? I mean, granted it was yes, a different culture, were but people. they were still human beings. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Handel liked food a bit too much, Bach drank brandy a lot. They were human. You know, I mean that, that's 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 what they were. And it's it makes me I'm happy, honestly, to see these kind of mistakes in their music mm. because it, I find it inspiring. You know, that it's a way to make a connection with them, right? Yeah. I mean, like they have to solve the same problems that that we're now trying to solve. I mean, for you know, for us, it's slightly different, mm. but um, but I, I think it's an important connection to draw, and so I I don't think it's dangerous to put them up on a pedestal. I think they deserve to be there, but I think if you make the pedestal too high, you inhibit your own progress. Mm. Yes. yes. I mean, you don't want to be constantly comparing yourselves to people like Bach. I mean, your life will be miserable, of course. <laughs> but you, you have. But the type of reverence I think one should have for Bach is one of somebody who was not born great, but of somebody who became great, and that you can also become great. Perhaps not as great as Bach, but maybe people confuse originality with genius, and and people also confuse stylistic originality with originality. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. is very possible to write Baroque music that does not sound like anything. And, and I, I think, if nothing else, I uh, accomplished that. I, I cannot sit here and say that I think my music is anywhere near as great as these people whose, whose portraits are hanging on my wall, right? But they are a source of inspiration for me. And I think by attempting to write music that I love as a result of listening to these composers and not paying so much attention about being different, I will eventually find things that I enjoy and things that I go for and things that I prioritize. And those will inevitably be different from what they prioritize. Yeah. It's I, just it's just something not to concern yourself with. Write the music that you want to hear and your voice will come out, period, the end. Yeah. It's such a downer talking about greatness in a way because greatness kind of, it just in some ways sucks the fun out of the whole conversation in many ways. I mean, it's, it's great. Well, to, that's kind to, of the to, point to, I make. Yeah, it's, it's it's nice to it's it's very good to to venerate a great composer and to respect him and to learn from him. Ultimately, the most important thing is to actually learn something because that's what Bach was doing, right? He was always copying scores. It seemed like constantly. The man, he seemed like he had a ravenous appetite for for new music constantly. So I he mean, he was always I, trying to solve new problems, and he didn't succeed at all of them, mind you. He succeeded at basically all of them, but but not, <laughs> but not all. Of them. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah no, there's a few I, I think, failed experiments in there. I think that's a great point to end on, which is the idea that we can really, that they, they had a different mindset, didn't they? I mean, they, they really, those composers were artisans. They were craftspeople. They were always developing. Um, and maybe Bach exemplifies the, the master craftsman probably in the best way. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, this is kind of like the fun part at the end. So anecdotes now. Okay. You're an early musician. Uh, living in this classical world, which is you're you're not in the majority, but not yet anyway, but <laughs> not yet. But who knows? Uh, I just read a comment that I thank you, Nikhil, for being part of the onslaught. I was like, whoa. <laughs> 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 well, thank you very much. <laughs> you're welcome. I have to agree. Thank you, Nikhil, yeah. for being part of the onslaught. I the really onslaught. Have to well, that's a bit aggressive <laughs> for me, but <laughs> but um, I, I mean, for me personally, and I always say this, I I don't really want to. I mean, it kind of goes with the territory, but I just want to mention a path that I never was aware of as a student that I really wish I, I knew, which is this whole Basso Continuo Partimento Thorough Bass path. I mean, I, for me, it was just the mainstream was all that there was. And honestly, if you go onto YouTube now, you type in analyses of songs, it's, you're only going to get really the, main, the mainstream kind of version of it. Uh, and I'm I'm saying what I would like is just you know people know that there is another option. That's why I love to interview uh, musicians who are expert at this because then they can give their perspective as well. But anyway, a anecdotes like in you've been in the trenches, just kind of like uh, one of my favorite anecdotes with another guest. I think it was Professor Salomon. He said uh, maybe this was even off the air, but he told me that he was just playing sequences for a new student. 
she burst into tears because it was so she just left she, she just thought the 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 I don't know I, I, if I could suspect it's always it's always up four down five it's always that one that's the one that gets everyone <laughs> so, but to, as, but, but he, that that's uh, the down sort four of thing. up five yeah down four yeah oh that's that's the epic one yeah that's down yeah. four so, up five. You mean down five up four? That's the one. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, oh, tell me about me student really reactions. Student student reactions. Um, yeah, just sh- share with me some 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 things you're, that were memorable for you teaching. Now, granted, it's been a few months, but you have been teaching, and we we have only our last conversation was like uh, in the years ago. I think it was like what 2020 or something. Or maybe late twenty twenty one. I'd have to look again, but it was some time ago. Any any memorable moments over the last couple of years? Plenty. I, I, I'm sorry to say, I'm, nothing's really coming to mind at the moment. That's really that funny or special. I mean, I have I have wonderful moments with my students all the time. But um, or your ensemble. I, I want to mention Nova Practica, which is a great you. ensemble. I'm going to give that a plug. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, <laughs> I appreciate um, yeah, that. How is it going on the musical early music cultural front line, so to speak? And I don't mean that in an aggressive question. way. I don't no, mean no, that in a that's, yeah. that's an interesting <laughs> question. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, Nova Practica is new, very much so. So we are still having to do a lot of groundwork. You know, I mean, we're invited to a few places a year uh, and we're happy to have those engagements. But in New York, we're mostly having to spend our own money giving concerts. And the response is interesting. Uh, I had a composer at Juilliard. I was a current student who I, who I just met after a, a concert. Ah, uh, yes, thank you. There we are on my couch in my living room. <laughs> um, and he came up to me after the concert and he said, he told me an interesting anecdote. Um, he said that he had written recently some music that was not even close to as traditional, of course, as the stuff that we're doing. You know, it was just quite tonally. I mean, it, as far as I'm concerned, I mean, and, and he didn't give me a bit of extreme description, but it sounded like it basically had a key signature and this was sort of what was, you know. And, and he brought it to his professors and he said, yes, this is very nice. You're right, it's beautiful music, well done. But we can't let you program this. We want people to take you seriously. Whoa. Interesting, right. Now, I remember my own Juilliard edition. So I, I actually auditioned at Juilliard three times uh, and, uh, and I only ended up attending one of the times. Um, but uh, I, I got in there for pre-college I auditioned again uh, for college for composition, okay. And uh, and I remember being told that my music was anachronistic at the time. Okay. And at the time, I was writing quite like Prokofiev or Shostakovich. Oh, okay, whoa, is, that was <laughs> really. I mean, you know, not sure. good enough. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly, right. And I remember being asked, "So, if you come here, you know, would you be willing to change your style?" And I'm said, and I gave an answer that. I, to this day, I defend, even though I was just a dumb, you know, 16, 17 year old kid. You know, I said, well, of course, I'm here to learn everything I can, but I'm not going to change the music that I want to hear just to to adhere to some set of, you know, like proper guidelines or something like that. I think it's wrong of you to police style. And they were quite offended by that. <laughs> yeah. So, so needless to People say, you know, give, I was not their first take. pick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I remember, I, here's, talk about an anecdote, okay, this is off topic, all right, but here's a good anecdote, he's dead now anyway, okay, so, but, so I went to my audition. You know, don't have Adler. to mention his name, too. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, so a composer who is, who is now dead, and was a professor at Juilliard, and that, that is plenty, actually, at this point, so there's enough ambiguity. Uh, I went to my, he was my final interview that day, okay, and he asked me, he sat down, he went through my materials, and he smiled at me. And he said, just with the most like devilish glee, he said, name every string quartet ever written starting with Haydn. This was for my audition, okay? And I lit up, okay? Because I (laughs) was obsessed with string quartets at the moment. And I (laughs) felt quite prepared to answer this question, actually, having just undergone a pretty deep review of basically all of the string quartets, okay? So I went through and I, I didn't, you know, I. Didn't forget that Baccarini wrote some and that Villalobos wrote some. You know, I did not, this was, you know, I, I knew that Bartok wrote a couple. You know, I mean, this is, I, I didn't miss too many, I had thought, right? 
You all I even do. had like the numbers, <laughs> right? I finally get done and I end with Elliot Carter. And now I don't remember how many streaming tests yeah. I've I think it's I think it's five. Uh, but um, and and he looked very disappointed, and and I, you know, uh, got a little scared. And he said, "Well, how many string quartets did I write?" And I said, "I turned white as a ghost." And I said, "I'm <laughs> really sorry, sir. I don't know how many string quartets that that you wrote." And he said, "Well, you should probably get to know your interviewers before you come in for an audition, don't you think?" And then he showed me the door. Right. Well, I, so I mean, I... so all of this is to say that modern composition at Juilliard, at least, is totally messed up, and it's not a place that anybody should be going for composition. Um, I mean, for one thing, one of their professors was just sacked for harassing people and all of that. So I have a lot of great things to say about Juilliard, but uh, yeah. their composition department. Well, I you would know it very well there. because you went there. I mean, you know, you you were there, you know, so you, you're perfectly placed to to comment well, on it. Actually, H, I, actually, I'm not because historical performance is quite separate from the rest of Juilliard. Yeah. Okay. I think I think the vast majority of the school does an excellent job, and I think in fact a lot of the time it gets a bad rap when it doesn't need to. I, I have mostly great things to say about Juilliard. It's staffed by some wonderful wonderful people, and of course, well, isn't that isn't well that fun. kind of a, a representative of, I guess you could say, quote unquote, modern composition? The the pressure and the 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 push into a particular direction across all of maybe North America, maybe. Other well, that's parts the thing about that's the thing about Nova Pratica, right? Because for We've had a little more success with early music people, right? Um, and that's sort of our audience, right? I mean, our argument is like, hey, we're, we're good at doing this. If you like these sounds, this is new. Program us, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's technically contemporary music, right? We don't mm -hmm. see it as really any less legitimate as somebody who is, you know, coming out of, coming out of school at Juilliard, you know, for composition and yeah. writing, you know, operettas or whatever it is they write these days. Um, you know, but it's... We've had a not so much success getting in with like contemporary music people, and mm -hmm. either they see it as not at the same level, or they poo poo it or something. Which comes from I think they're just totally misguided about that. People have this this horrible idea that music's progression is somehow linear or something like that. It's, they just have they've been they've it's, been oh fed. it's certainly it's certainly linear. I mean, but this is the direction. Yeah, <laughs> so, so, well, it is well, linear. I, I would. I think there's a lot of excellent music throughout all all, all periods. Really, I do. But but I think it's very strange that people insist on this this sort of you know it, uh, incessant onslaught of stylistic originality and it, and it just it doesn't make any sense to me it's not really the point um but anywho uh yeah, no, you know so so i think very, some of them are good. quite threatened by it i think rightfully so because like a lot of the music that's being written today and this is so much less true than it was 40 years ago 50 years ago and like the peak of crap is like 1950 60 and that is just not the case a lot of modern music these days is like film music which mm. people really enjoy, and there, and, and I wish people would give contemporary compositions more of a chance because it is a lot more audience friendly these days than it mm. was. Okay, so I'm not, you're not going to, to get, you're not going to get any insults about contemporary music as a whole out of me because as a whole, it's quite varied. That's a, a great topic, and maybe you know, and uh, Professor Gonzano, I wanted you to come back on a panel in the future. I think it would be great uh -huh. to talk about composition and uh it would be really great to have you back to talk about these things because that is a huge topic and i'm getting fired up but it's the end of the interview why yeah. am i getting fired up at the I end know, of the interview it's too bad i know but you <laughs> should put me on with like, you should put me on with you know some composition <laughs> faculty somewhere who think that this is ridiculous and i i've been pre i have been preparing for that sparring match my whole life so i'd love if you gave thank me the you opportunity to do. <laughs> that would that would send the subscriber base up we need a few debates on this on this yeah, darn show go. yeah well okay you would, uh, what can I say? I mean, this is the great Professor Nicola Saraceni Canzano. I mean, brilliant Close man, enough. brilliant man, and a great teacher, great uh, professor. I, I really, uh, what what a treat for your students to 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 work with you. I and mean, you're very knowledgeable. I mean, we're, we're cracking Please. jokes, and it seems light, but really, I'm serious. I'm an admirer. I'm a fan. I wouldn't have you on the show. No, I'm serious. I wouldn't have you on the show if, if, if it wasn't educational and useful. For my audience and especially for me so um the great well, I, I hope uh, we learned something other than what i look like when i'm embarrassed <laughs> <laughs> well great well the, the great professor Gonzalo, thank you so much we'll talk to you very soon bye bye thanks now. so much nikki it's really great to see you it really is thanks a lot keep in touch okay absolutely
Thank you. 